Arno Lave is with me. Uh, Arno Lave is head of Blockchain Lab Philips. Uh, Mr. Lave, what does blockchain mean for Philips? Well, blockchain means uh, for Philips actually a way to innovate with privacy at the heart of the innovation, uh, especially in relation to data, medical data that is extremely important. Medical data? Yes. Uh, explain, please, what kind of data? Data like in your um, doctor's office or in your hospital that is stored in electronic form, uh, but it can also be data from your Fitbit, from your Apple Watch, um, any kind of data that has to do with your health. Uh, why is that business for Philips? Because uh, connecting that data gives a very good view of the patient uh, and we can build services on top of that. For instance, if you are diabetic, uh, we can build services to make sure that you track and trace everything that is important to you, that you take your medicine at the right time, etc. So this is, uh, the, the business is the data, not yes. the hardware anymore. No. Well, Because Philips, Philips Healthcare is yeah. known about hardware, right? Absolutely. So do you think the, the, the data might be a bigger business? In It, the end. Yes, absolutely. And uh, at this point, uh, the hardware is still the most important part. I think we are just starting with the data and looking at what kind of services we can uh, develop there. But uh, in terms of future, uh, I very much believe that data will drive a lot of the business in healthcare in Philips. Um, uh, you're the head of a lab. Yes. Uh, so that means uh, it's in the lab. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Blockchain in the lab at Philips. Uh, when does it come out of the lab? When uh, is it going to be released in the real world? Yeah, that's a decision that, that's not mine to make. Um, uh, that is something that will be done by our, uh, uh, by our steering committee, uh, obviously, which, is, uh, which are senior executives at, uh, at Philips. Um, I, The reason why we did started in a lab is because we wanted to build and learn. And building and learning can best be done with this very nascent technology, because let's face it, that's it, uh, in a lab setting where you can actually break stuff uh, without uh, hurting anyone. Uh, what did you break? <laughs> so far, uh, we're good, uh, I should say. Uh, we learned a lot uh, from the experiments that we did and from the uh, stuff that we built. So one of the learnings, for instance, and this was actually also shown by the uh, the, the, the hack of the, the DAO, uh, which happened yep. uh, last week, um, is that um, we say, as a design principle, leave as much logic off the blockchain uh, and only use the blockchain to verify uh, specific data, to verify verify the integrity of the data and to verify identities of the peoples or, or machines that are using, uh, uh, that are using the data. Um, so uh, safety. Safety, very much. That's, yeah. that's a big thing. Security, privacy, yes. those are the biggest things. <sighs> yes. But it, it cannot be guaranteed, right? Um, uh, what can be guaranteed in the world, I would yeah. say, first of all. But um, let's turn that question around. Can you guarantee uh, privacy in a centralized system, in the current setup that it is? The, the mere fact that you don't know that whether the data from your Apple Watch goes to your uh, healthcare insurer or not mm -hmm. uh, is a vulnerability in itself. And trust will come into play because you have to trust Apple that they do the right stuff. They, you have to trust the insurer that they do the right stuff. But it's not transparent. And blockchain enables it to be transparent. And that's a very big thing. The patient uh, data problem in the Netherlands is privacy. Yes, that's that's why it is a political political problem. Uh, I think you're solving this problem, aren't you? Yes, I, I I think so as well. You're designing the system that could be used in the Netherlands and other countries uh, for storing and exchanging patient data. Yes, that's what you do. That is uh, uh -huh. uh, one of the things that we are that we are looking at uh, more in general. Let's say beyond health data, I think you could say what blockchain enables is a Google Maps towards your data. Uh, and do that in a very secure way mm. with the individual in control of their data. Uh, and how could this, this, this technology uh, make me healthier, make us healthier? What, could you, what, what, what can you do with that? Well, I think that we already know quite a bit uh, from big data analysis. So, for instance, uh, prediction of heart failure is already possible uh, several months before it happens. Um, uh, and there are all kinds of variables that go into that model. So what if I knew, let's say, more exactly uh, your status, whether that is your genome, whether that is uh, all kinds of other circumstantial evidence that goes into a model, uh, and that model checks against what we already know from big data 
data analysis, then uh, it could prevent you actually from uh, from becoming ill, or it can prevent you from having something like a stroke, for instance. Like my genome is going to be in in that piece of blockchain data. Yeah, let's be very clear. Everything. Yes, well, let's be very clear that... Of everybody. That blockchain, <laughs> that blockchain is merely the coordination layer. So um, we are absolutely not planning to put any medical data on a blockchain, simply because a blockchain is transparent uh, and you don't want that to be. And I very much believe that the data will stay in the silos where it is. But if you have your genome sequenced with one of these companies that is around and that does that and, I, and your Fitbit data... Uh, uh, and you control all this data, and you give an application of Philips access to that data, I think that uh, uh, you can have some very valuable services. And yes, yes, and, and will Philips, um, who be the owner of the data? Well, that's a, a, an interesting question, from especially from a legal point of view. So we actually have on our team uh, uh, legal experts who are looking into this because the regulation is not very clear about this. So let's say that you are the uh, uh, owner of the data or at least the controller of the data and I send an algorithm to you and say, well, in this app you can use your data, but Philips will never see the data. Uh, uh, it will only run in the app. What is then the legal status of that data? That's a big question. And uh, regulators, regulations, privacy regulations are made around centralized systems. And this is a decentralized system. They never thought of this. Uh, uh, but it's a good thing that I see more and more, especially in Europe, um, uh, politicians as well as regulators uh, being interested in this subject of blockchain and uh, in de decentralized data. So probably the law is the biggest problem. The law is the biggest challenge. Challenge. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> It's not a problem. Uh, law I mean, is a law, law needs to be there, yeah. and we need to uh, see how we can work with the law. And I think that one of our findings is that blockchain could enable a much more privacy-friendly solution. At the other hand, it doesn't fit the current regulation. So uh, that brings you to politics. Politicians change laws. Yes. Will they do that? Quick enough? Um, uh, never quick enough, obviously not. Technology is always way ahead of, uh, of regulation, is way ahead of politicians. But I find it very encouraging to see certain politicians, European Parliament members like Marietje Schaken, uh, being interested in this and really getting informed on what it means uh, uh, to use blockchain and to have decentralized data. Mr. Lava, thank you very much. You're welcome.